is Matt Martin. Matt has been the executive director of the Trumbull Neighborhood Partnership since it began in 2010 and has directed the organization's management of the Trumbull County Land Bank since 2013. Prior to joining TNP, he was a land reutilization manager for Stockyard Development Organization, which is a Cleveland area CDC. Uh, Matt has a BA in Liberal Studies from Cleveland State and an MA in Environmental Studies from Cleveland State's Levine College of Urban Affairs. Uh, please welcome Matt. And I just want to talk to you a little bit today about our work and our experience with community revitalization, in particular utilizing a land bank as a tool for community revitalization. So. Um, and it sounds like your land bank is going to be in good hands. I mean, you're going to recognize a lot of what I said um, from the previous speaker to, with the plans for the land bank. So just to get started, a little background. The organization I run is not the land bank. It's a 501c3 community development nonprofit. Uh, we've been around since 2010, and we have a mission to revitalize and, and protect the quality of life in Warren and Trumbull County's neighborhoods. The land bank was started in 2011. Uh, based on that legislation that, that uh, Jason told you about a little bit ago. Um, so basically the way I like to describe it, we've been friends with the land bank since it started and we formalized that relationship in 2013 into a contract. But let me back up and, and, and sort of uh, give you the background here. All of this work is predicated on a problem, a challenge, or, you know, whatever you want to call it. This is a 2010 vacancy survey for the city of Warren. The city of Warren, by the way, has a population of 39,000. So a, a little bigger than Portsmouth, but it sounds like we're in the, the same category. Um, all those little green and red dots, especially towards the middle, southwest and the north end, are either vacant lots or vacant houses. Uh, rather than make you squint, I'll just show you the data. Particularly in central Warren, 35% of our residential properties are vacant. Southwest Warren, 38%. So that's staggering. Uh, the total is 1639. That's, a, of course, a moving target, but uh, you know, well over 1,500 vacant houses at any moment, uh, population 39,000. From what I understand, you have something like 500 vacant houses here. Uh, so, so it sounds like we're in kind of the same shape, more or less. Uh, another aspect, and I won't spend too much time on this today. I know you guys want to hear the nuts and bolts of land banking, but uh, Two-thirds of Warren is also a food desert. Our residents lack access to uh, fresh, healthy food. Uh, and and I'll, I'll talk a little bit about how Land Bank can actually help mitigate some of that food insecurity. But um, our organization relies heavily on resident-driven community development. So in other words, we do community outreach around our efforts before we do them. Uh, our, our philosophy is that you know, we might be the experts, but the last thing we want to do is sit back in our, you know, I would say lofty offices, actually our offices aren't that lofty, but you know, with maps and just sort of decide what's going to happen and then go tell the community what it is. Uh, community outreach is crucial. Um, you all probably know that, and in, in a smaller town it's, it's too easy to not do it. Um, when I started my career in Cleveland, it was very difficult for an entity like a land bank to communicate directly with the neighbor or the neighborhood about what was going to come next after our house was demolished. Usually they go through a third party organization. Well, our organization, we do the demolition and we also do the end use. So it's, it's pretty easy for us to go out and do outreach. Um, so we, you know, we, we did that, we continue to do that. But 2014, we did a specific study where we talked to over 250 Warren residents. Uh, nothing that we learned surprised us at all. Our residents are concerned about jobs, education and crime. Um, they're also concerned about safety and blight, vacant property, high grass, recreation, public art, passive green spaces. So not all of those are things that we're able to hit cleanly through our work, but uh, quite a few of them are actually something that we can mitigate through uh, blight remediation. So just talking about engaging residents, I mean quite literally hosting public meetings where residents have the opportunity to see the data that we've collected um, but, and then give input on solutions. Um, so we did a pretty significant outreach process in 2014. Um, and the result of that outreach was a series of neighborhood plans uh, for each part of town in the city of Warren. Um, nothing in these plans but is a big surprise to anyone, at least philosophically. The strategies are a little more specific. So when I think of land banking, I have to simplify things myself to understand them. Uh, basically, we're identifying derelict vacant properties that are tax delinquent 
um, and then considering their end use. And among the options for end use are demolition or renovation, basically for any structure. Um, if you do demolition, you have to consider a land use uh, for after the demolition. And if you consider a renovation, you have to think of the end use uh, after renovation. So do, are you looking for an owner occupant? Are you considering it for an investment property? And those, those factors are all different depending on uh, commercial, residential. Um, but, but our neighborhood plan prioritized demolition of residential vacant properties. That was the most pressing need in the city of Warren. This is another map of Warren with our 11 target areas for demolition. This was a requirement of the NIP grant. Now that's the same grant that you all will be applying for if you uh, do in fact form a land bank or, and, and get an application in. So of course, uh, th that'll make a little less money for us to go after, but uh, we're all in this together, so I'm glad to see you guys moving forward on it. Uh, but one thing you'll have to do is create target areas. So, so to the, the point of the gentleman before me, you know, identifying what the priorities are. Uh, which neighborhoods do you want to you want to go after the neighborhood with the most blight and, and sort of go through and get rid of everything that's vacant and, and, and terrible? Or do you want to focus more on uh, the, the worst house on a very nice and stable street? Uh, you know, I can defend both sides of that point. Uh, chances are, if you put together a good application, you'll have enough money to do a little bit of both. Um, so everybody loves a good demolition action shot, particularly the neighbors. Um, so this is just to say that we, we do tear houses down. Uh, this is where the money's come from. Uh, before the NIP program, there was a program uh, that the Attorney General put forth uh, called Moving Ohio Forward, and that allowed us $1.2 That was actually the result of a bank settlement. So some of the uh, lending practices that perhaps led to the foreclosure crisis, uh, banks had to cough up some money as a result of that, and the Ohio Attorney General opted to use a significant portion of that money to help communities tear down houses. But you had to have a land bank to get the money. So that was uh, really the impetus for us creating our land bank. Uh, moving forward to NIP, uh, same deal. You have to have a land bank to get the money. Uh, we got a fairly sizable allocation right off the bat, 3.2 million. Uh, the additional monies, the 982 and then the 500,000, those are based exclusively on our performance. So our ability to bring in properties and tear them down. Um, believe it or not, there's other counties that had trouble doing that. Uh, there's a reason for that. It's, it's, it's a little bit, it's n not complicated, but it can be complex. Uh, you have to identify tax delinquency. So um, if a property is vacant and derelict and abandoned, it doesn't matter how bad of condition it's in, if the taxes are paid, the land bank is not the tool that you can utilize to tear it down. Uh, that said, we found in our community a significant portion of our derelict vacant houses are tax delinquent. So targeting those and then getting your prosecutor on board to do tax foreclosures or using the BOR process to do expedited tax foreclosures. Uh, so there's a couple working parts and pieces and they all have to be sort of firing on, on all cylinders and, and, and everyone on the same page. Um, you sort of need a community agreement that the land bank is the right place for derelict vacant property. Um, because what happens is the land bank gets all the derelict vacant property that comes through tax foreclosure and then becomes you know, the, the largest light owning entity in town. So uh, if, if the community sort of has a shared agreement that the end use is for the greater good of the community, then uh, that, that can be um, the most productive way to go forward. Uh, I have to note that we also have been successful in getting some private demolitions done. We have neighbors to vacant properties, commercial or residential, that have said, you know, thank you for acquiring this property. I don't want to wait on a government grant or on you know, my neighborhood to be identified as a target area. If you transfer the property to me for $1, I will tear, tear it down out of my own pocket. Uh, so we've done about $150,000 worth of demolitions on that side of it. Um, hey, the, you know, a private citizen can tear down a property with a lot less red tape than we can, so it works for us. Um, so as I mentioned, uh, we've taken a, a, a philosophical approach that a demolition strategy requires a land use strategy. Um, while it is important to rid communities of these derelict vacant structures, um, you have to consider the land use afterwards. I think of uh, the problem in Warren in terms of our, our, our blighted housing stock is a finite problem. We will get through those 1,500 or so vacant houses 
uh, you know, five years, ten years, whatever the case may be, but will be left with vacant land for much longer than that, if not permanently. And that's sort of the idea of one of the ideas of a shrinking city is reimagining what your community looks like uh, in terms of infrastructure, neighborhood layout, uh, with less people and less housing. So we do everything we can to identify an end use for every lot uh, before we tear it down. And um, priority 1A is the side lot program. That means transferring the, the property to the neighbor. So if we do tear down the house next to you, I don't know if it needs to be torn down. Uh, the first thing that we do, we warn, is knock on the neighbor's door and, and see if they want the lot. Um, so you see some numbers there of what we've done, but we, you know, it's, we do it by the hundred. Uh, it's, it's our most successful program, at least by volume. Um, so before we get into any community gardening or park space or anything like that, we want to expand private property, uh, stabilize, if not increase, property value, uh, and you know, just give people, let pe the people that have been living next to these properties benefit once they're down. Um, we cannot waive the cost of a, a side lot, at least we've opted not to. There is a cost that government incurs through the tax foreclosure process. Uh, it's a couple hundred dollars, so that's what neighbors are paying for the lots. But being that we are a nonprofit, we have the ability to go ask for funding. Huntington Bank gave us uh, $22,000 over three years um, to then redistribute funds through uh, Lowe's gift cards to neighbors. So you buy your side lot for 500 bucks, give you a gift card to Lowe's for $500. Um, you have to fill out an application whether you're saying you know I'm going to do this elaborate landscaping uh, deal or just you know I've been going that lot for the last decade since it's been empty I need a new lawnmower. We'll approve it. We're pretty open at what we'll approve. Um, and that's really uh, one of our favorite things to do is uh, just hand people gift cards and uh, take a picture of it. Uh, it's pretty simple. I want to talk briefly about our garden resources of Warren. I did talk about food insecurity in, in Warren. It's a huge issue there. I'm not certain if it is here or not. Um, I would guess that it is. Um, so garden resources of Warren is sort of a parallel program. It's not a land bank program, but uh, the resounding majority of our gardens are located on land bank owned properties after demolitions. Um, what we do is help rate residents start gardens uh, if they want to, basically. Um, gardens require gardeners, so the last thing that we will ever do is just start one and help people show up and, and weed. Uh, I spent one summer about 10 years ago weeding a garden that I thought was a good idea in Cleveland, and that was where I came up with that idea that I would never do that again. Uh, I do garden, but uh, I won't be gardening on any, anyone else's uh, garden anytime soon. So. This is the Porter Street Garden, just an example of a pretty successful food production site. You see we've incorporated some public art elements. Um, pretty simple. Neighbors are involved. Neighbors make the rules. We provide the technical support. Uh, we were able to get a grant to install water infrastructure on site. Uh, the city of Warren installed it at cost. And so, you know, neighbors have the, the combination to the lock that's on the water. Um, and they hook up a hose and water their, their garden. And um, you know, plot assignments are done by residents, not by our, our organization. Um, so we really want to be the, the, the technical support for these sites. The land bank retains ownership of these sites and basically sign an MOU with these residents. Uh, typically, gardens, garden groups don't want to own the land. If they did, you know, we'd be, we'd be selling it to them. But in most cases, they'd rather just sort of focus on this. Um, so we, we figure out another way. Um, one thing I wanted to mention was the importance of engaging partners. I think this is a room full of partners. Um, so well, there's a lot of work to be done, especially around uh, community revitalization land use. Uh, we work with a lot of churches and other groups that come out and help us get things done. You know, this garden needed just a, a little greenhouse that they could get plants started in. Uh, the movement church was willing to come out and spend a day installing it. Um, so this is another garden, a piece of Hope Garden. You're, you're starting to get the idea, although if you notice in this one, there's some actually uh, some doors and other uh, features. Those were pulled from houses that we demolished. So this site was really focused on flowers and public art. Um, and uh, so engaging partners, engage youth. This is a youth group from Northmar Church. Uh, we brought them in. They had a, you know, like a service week through the summer, and they came and spent some time helping us to install the garden. Um, that first push to install a community garden can be fairly heavy, so uh, even though we do make sure that the residents are going to be involved long term, 
we're not opposed to bringing a group in to help them uh, through the heavy lifting day one. Uh, so this is the children's garden, um, and it's located in our central city. See, uh, pour some concrete there and have a, uh, this is uh, the giving tree by Shel Silverstein. Um, this is the theme of this garden. That's a, a tree with each branch going out to a different garden bed. Um, this group gives free gardening lessons to children all summer. So this is, uh, and there was a, a vacant house there about 18 months ago. So um, that's a very productive program. So, um, so Jason mentioned uh, the greeting money that would come from lots for, for, from the NIP grant. Uh, if you all get your land bank up and running and get a demolition grant, you'll have up to $25,000 to spend per demolition. You are allowed to use $6,000 of that money to green the lots. Uh, you don't have to. It's not use it or lose it. If you opt not to use it, then you know that stays in your in your fund that you can use for more demolitions. The way that we've opted to approach that so far was to create a program called Lots to Love, um, so that we're spending the $6,000 only on projects that the public, the public wants to see. So, um, in order to kick that program off, we called it Lots to Love. We brought in some speakers that talked about work that they had done uh, throughout the region. So, this is a Lots to Love site. This is specific to the NIP demolition grant. Uh, matter of fact, this site actually got an award yesterday from Serve Ohio. These folks spent uh, about 500 hours out volunteering to get this done. So what that let them do was spend the full $6,000 just on materials and they did all the work themselves as opposed to spending it on a contract installation. Um, and they really turned it into a really multi-use site. There's some, there some uh, garden beds there. there. This is actually like a xylophone. I heard the kids playing it yesterday. Uh, you know, they have a chalkboard and you know, it's, it's really just a magnificent, magnificent site. Also, uh, formerly home to uh, like one of the worst uh, vacant houses in the community. Uh, going back to that engaging partners, um, Kent State's urban design students spent a summer semester working on Warren basically proposing uses uh, for vacant land. And um, we didn't want that to just be an academic project, so we let them know what our budget was for these residential lots. And if they can keep their proposals within our budget that we could actually use them. And that's exactly what happened. Woodland Park was designed basically by Kent State students who interacted with our residents um, and let them know what they wanted to see. Uh, they spent the, the, you know, the spring uh, working on the plans and the summer installing it. And this is near our bike path, so it has some bicycle infrastructure. That's a fix-a-flat and a bike pump station right there. Um, there's some climbing nets. I never did fully understand that, but the, the neighbors wanted it, and that's what matters. Um, so we've also worked to engage corporate partners. You know you'll have a, a company that wants to do a, a day in the community. Um, perhaps some of you have participated in those kinds of things. We make sure that we're getting the most out of those days and bringing them out, whether it's to help you know, our senior residents with their landscaping or work on some of these lots of love and greening projects. Uh, just a few more photos here of our Lots to Love sites. And then we had um, new school students from New York City come out and help us with land use. Excuse me. We've used uh, stones from, wall, from, from houses that we've demolished, foundation stones, to build corner uh, retainer walls and other landscape features. And we've also used public art to beautify our neighborhoods. So I'm just kind of keeping an eye on the clock, make sure you all get out of here at one o'clock. We really haven't even got into the housing portion of it yet. Um, as you can see, we've incorporated public art into our work. We have a farmer's market. I'll, I'll tell you what, I'll stay around after if anyone wants to talk more about local food. But I would, I would like to move on into the, the real uh, nitty gritty housing side of uh, land banking. So we get properties in. Um, we have to assess them and make decisions about their end use. Now, for me, I've been doing this a while, and I also have just enough common sense. Most of them are pretty obvious as to what needs to happen. You know, we have a demolition, and we have something that can be salvaged. Um, but nonetheless, we do have a professional that comes in and does an intake assessment. Now, the demolitions we usually dismiss outright and move on, uh, particularly if they have if they have you know significant complaints or are condemned by the city or the fire department. Uh, but for the properties that are sort of 
hard to understand what the future could be for them. Uh, we, we basically produce a detailed assessment of what the property needs in terms of renovation. And that applies to commercial properties too. Uh, there is obviously a lot of opportunity for economic development through the land bank. You don't have to limit your scope to residential properties. Um, so, once we bring a property in, we sell it through a number of uh, programs. One is deed and escrow program. Basically what that means is you're going to buy the property from us as is and fix it up yourself. Um, for our residential properties, we require you to be an owner-occupant. You have to agree to live in it for three years uh, and you have to show us a detailed work plan that you'll have to execute in a period of time and uh, you'll have to show the funding to execute that work plan. Now we keep the title to the property in the county land bank while the buyer executes the work, the work plan. So that's the leverage that we have to make sure that it gets completed. Uh, they also sign a document uh, promising to live there for three years and we do have legal recourse to take the property back if they attempt to rent it out or flip it. Um, so buyers must provide detailed work plan, cost of rehab, proof of financing, time of completion. Uh, we've, we've only had one person ever fail on one of these rehabs where we've taken the property back. Uh, we we'll give an extension where people need to. Uh, basically, we're trying to work with people on this as long as they're putting forth an effort. So just to give you an idea of what uh, the numbers look like on these, $3,500 for the house, estimated rehab around twenty grand, and the market value is thirty. So you can see it's a pretty good deal, particularly if you're someone that has the, the ability to do the renovation yourself or to write checks to have it done. Um, it's not for everybody. There, some of you may know renovating a property is, a, is an enormous job. Um, but for those that can take it on, it can be a screaming deal for a, a residential property. So far, uh, $550,000 worth of sale prices have resulted in nearly a million dollars in private rehab investments. So we see that as a huge win for our communities. Um, we also work a similar deal with uh, real estate developers. Uh, we'll sell the house at a reduced price. Oftentimes we'll actually give it to the developer. Um, they have to have a strong track record of rehab. And then their resale, their end use of the property is restricted to selling it to an owner occupant. So I don't get too much in the weeds on it, but basically uh, we require them to meet their end goals of owner occupancy. They're free to make money on the property so long as they uh, you know, sell it to an owner occupant. And then for some portion of our properties, we do the renovations ourselves. That's work that in our, in our first year we didn't do a whole lot of. Uh, simply because it was simpler in our early days when our capacity was lower to push them out as is. Uh, but in the last 18 months, we've really ramped up our activity renovating properties ourselves. Uh, like I said, everybody can't renovate a property, so uh, a lot of people just want turnkey, move-in ready properties. So we're doing more and more ourselves. Uh, we do those through general contractors at this point, and they're of course restricted to owner occupants and they're priced at or below market value. Uh, we have, since we have that restriction, sometimes we need to consider a lower price than what might be typical. Um, so here's an example, property on Laird in Northeast Warren, which is one of those target demolition areas. Uh, this one we were able to save, and the list price was $34,900. We had a young lady buy this house for $31,000. Um, this is the inside of that property, and this is a beautiful house with, with great woodwork. $32,000, that was the price that she paid for it. Uh, she's there for at least three years, if not longer. This is another property, uh, just a little before and after there. This was in uh, Girard, which is actually a suburb of Warren. That's why you're seeing a slightly higher list price. Of course, uh, while our focus is on the city of Warren, where the lion's share of blight is, uh, we are countywide with our efforts. So, uh, this Huntington Bank land bank saleable product uh, I really don't want to get too much into this, but the, the, the basics of this is that Huntington has agreed to back loans for, for land bank properties uh, that need renovation. So we've had a few buyers on this, it's kind of a new product, but basically for properties that are, uh, you know, that we would sell for $10,000 and need, you know, $40,000 worth of work, uh, Huntington will make the $50,000 loan and, and so long as the land bank backs the loan, much like the federal government does for a 203K. So this is something that's been working. Um, the challenge there is usually the appraisal, that we can get the property to appraise at the $50,000, even taking into account the renovation. But I just mentioned this to say, you, know, you have to be able to bring lending partners in um, to make these work because uh, 
it's not all, it's not easy to borrow to borrow against a property that needs a full renovation. Um, I've just made some lists of our partnerships here. So we're kind of getting low on time here. So I think what I'll what I'll do is just pause. And are there any questions or comments for me or anything that I can answer for you all? Because we have such a hard time renovating properties to the to the quality that we want them to be, and then selling them at that cost, um, we partnered with some private investors on something called the Adopt a Home program. We got a donation of twenty five thousand dollars from a local businessman, um, and basically it's rehabs that would not otherwise be feasible. In other words, houses that we would lose money on renovating and selling. Um, so that leaves them as either properties that were just listing for sale, you know and never being able to move or tearing down because of economics as opposed to because they're actually in terrible shape. It's limited to one neighborhood, which is our central city. And basically it allows us to break even on property sales or even lose money if we need to try to stabilize one neighborhood. So we renovated this house for 25 and sold it for 24 or five uh, in Warren's Garden District. We did another rehab on Scott Street Basically, we tore down uh, two houses, one on either side, renovated the middle house, restored it to its former glory. Um, we renovated that house for around 60K and I think sold it close to 50. But this house inside is beautiful. I mean, it's just, it's a classic historic property. I wish we could have saved all three, but that was not realistic. Um, so what we did is use the NIP money, demolish two, and save the third and put a family in it. We did that through our adopt a home program, which allowed us to renovate it right and then sell it at a slight loss based on a, a donation from the private uh, community. So our, our total impact since we got this thing started, 144 houses returned to occupancy compared to 210 demolitions. Uh, we're mostly in the news for demolitions. Uh, that's what most people want to see. Uh, that's what a lot of people are talking about. But uh, you know, our goal is to save as much as we can as well. So that's 144 um, home ownership opportunities created by land banking, 300 plus side lots, and uh, dozens of public land use projects. So, uh, and, and that's really with us just focusing on residential so far. Uh, we're just now starting to take a look at commercial properties more and more and look at the economic development uh, possibilities, particularly in downtown Warren. Uh, we wanted to really get ourselves um, set up in residential and, and establish some successes and build some capacity before we did. Um, that is the end of my presentation. Uh, I'll ask you like, one more time for any questions or comments. I'm glad to answer anything. Yes? <coughs> Um, well, I'll reiterate the first one, which is reach out to the community, make sure that neighbors are involved in your plans or else uh, A, they won't work, or and B, the residents will actually be resentful even of things that are productive. Uh, nobody likes to, uh, you know, someone living next to a vacant house for a number of years and then all of a sudden one day a truck shows up and you should just start working on it. Uh, there can be a basic resentment there that's easily avoidable if the day you, the land bank acquires the property, we have these little door knockers that say, you're being contacted because the property next to you may have entered the Trumbull County Land Bank. Please give us a call before we move forward. It's not an offer to buy the land. It's not you know, necessarily that we're gonna do whatever you tell us, but just reaching out to neighbors. Uh, so that would be the first one. Um, the second one, and it sounds like you guys are gonna do this, but get the data first. Um, you know, it's, it's easy to look at the problem anecdotally. You know, you have a neighborhood that everybody knows is in terrible condition and all those houses need to come down. Uh, but get the data to support what you're after. Um, it'll be 